Well, listen, thank you for coming, everybody. And they warned me that it's a bit loud in here, so I'm going to have to shout. So maybe I'll talk for less. Uh, but if you can't hear me, maybe people want to move forward a bit or, or just let me know anyhow. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Paragon Diamonds. First of all, the standard disclaimer. There's a, a hard copy to take away if you want to read it at your leisure, so I'll skip that. Paragon Diamonds is a diamond development company that is active predominantly in Lesotho. Uh, we're listed on AIM. We have a market cap of about 11 and a half million pounds. Share price is currently in the level of 4p. We have uh, four major sort of blocks of shareholders. We have Optala Resources, who are also here as our major shareholder. Landstead Capital, another large institutional shareholder. Grandinex Private Investment Vehicle, and the final 30% approximately is free float. So what are we doing? We've basically been in business for three years. Uh, we listed on AIM in November 2010. Uh, we soon after that acquired a series of projects. The principal one is the Limpani Kimberlite project, which is a large Kimberlite in Lesotho. Uh, Lesotho is a very desirable diamond uh, target. It is known to host some of the largest diamond Kimberlites in the world. These are Kimberlites which produce exceptionally large diamonds. Uh, anecdotally, of the 20 largest diamonds ever found on this planet, a quarter of them have come from Lesotho. We have other projects. We have uh, some interesting exploration ground in Zambia, which are another type of diamond deposit called Lamproite. They're very similar to the Allendale and Argyle kind of deposits in Australia. So that's something that we want to look at in due course. And we also have some uh, newly acquired exploration ground in Botswana, which is always a good address to go looking for large kimberlites. Our management team, it's myself, Steve Grimmer as the MD, our chairman, Martin Doyle, and our CFO, uh, I'll just go through the details, our CFO, Simon Retter. We have a non-executive director, uh, Buddy, Buddy Doyle from Canada. So three of us are diamond people. We've all got 20 plus years experience in, in, uh, in diamond exploration and mine development. Martin was with De Beers for many, many years, uh, most recently as VP in Canada. Uh, Buddy was one of the discovery team for the Akati Diamonds for Rio Tinto. And I've got more of a background with private equity companies and uh, small cap companies in Canada and in London. So what are we trying to do? We're basically, we're in the business of identifying kimberlites that are worth developing and taking them through to development. So we're about building mining companies as opposed to exploration. It is very much firmly rooted in evaluation and it's very much rooted in producing a working mine in the relatively short term. So a little bit about the, the business. Uh, they're not making any more diamonds. It's, Unlike other commodities, maybe oil would be the example. Uh, nobody has found any major diamond deposits in the last 20 years. Uh, there's only really about 15 major diamond mines in the world, and they're all at an advanced stage of production. Even what we think of as, as some of the most advanced and recent discoveries, say in Canada, Ekati and Dyavik, are already sort of halfway through their life. Uh, a lot of the mines are going underground. So what's happening now is companies are looking at the second tier of targets. These are the targets, a bit like the oil field analogy again, these are the targets that were discovered 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago and dismissed out of hand because they did not meet the main criteria of high grade uh, and large. But what's happened is we're now going to the workover stage where people are looking at the second tier, these initial discoveries which were overlooked in the past. And a good example is the low-grade, high-value deposits. A, a perfectly good example is the AK6 project in Botswana, where Lukara Diamonds have now put that into production, and it's proven to be spectacular. 
similarly in Lesotho. Lesotho mines have been put back into production. The Letseng mine, which produces the highest value diamonds in the world, was abandoned in 1983 and put back into, into production in 2006, and now is the major producer in Lesotho. But you can look here that basically what's happening is even with the new discoveries, and I know this is hard to read, even with the new discoveries, we are seeing a tapering off. And this is production, and this would be consumer demand. So basically, diamonds are becoming a finite resource. So again, you know, a very simple slide. I'll just skip over it. Basically, it shows you that from the mine through to final production, there's added value at each stage. And if you can have an integrated company that controls the source of rough diamonds, you're in the driving seat for being able to work with the subsequent downstream producers and add value in that way as well. So a little bit about Lesotho. Where are we? All the diamond mines are clustered in the sort of northeast of the country. It's a very stable uh, country confined entirely within South Africa. Very easy to access. Four hour drive from Johannesburg. International services on, on your doorstep. Uh, there's four mines all served by, by roads and infrastructure. Uh, the most famous one is Letseng, which is here. The other big producing mine is Kau, which is here. Uh, the Likabong mine belongs to Firestone. That's now a development project. And the Motai mine belongs to Lukara. And we have the fifth large kimberlite in Lesotho, which is Lempani. And they're all sort of large kimberlites. Lempani, for instance, is five hectares in size, uh, six hectares in size, and that's comparable with uh, the other mines. They're all sort of in the same ballpark figure. So here's an overview. I don't know if you can see the image, but that's our bulk sampling site there, very close to the kimberlite. But we're looking for a resource. We're looking to develop it. We're looking to build a mine and generate short-term cash flow. And ultimately, we're looking to develop that as a major large-scale operation, which is comparable to the other high-value diamond mines in Lesotho. So a little bit about the project itself. We hold an 85% interest with our local partner. Our local partner is a contributing partner, and he's also one of the biggest mining contractors in Lesotho. So he gives us a lot of very practical support in the operational area. We're only 27 kilometers from the Letseng mine, uh, which is owned by Gem Diamonds. Uh, they're producing diamonds over $2,000 a carat. As I said earlier, the most valuable diamonds on the planet. It's the last of the large kimberlites in Lesotho to, uh, to be evaluated. There aren't any more. There's very little potential to go exploring in Lesotho and find large kimberlites anymore. So this really is, is it. And we're looking at basically an open pit mine. We have drilled it to 350 meters in depth. We've shown that there's 46 million tons of kimberlite present in the ground. So it's a case of developing it. We've uh, established uh, a provisional grade and a provisional value. And we're now looking to take it from the evaluation stage into the first stage of development. So again, in a quick summary, it's exceptional diamonds. They're large, they're high value. Lesotho in particular is known for a kind of diamond called type 2As. These fetch prices far in excess of the normal diamond prices. Give you an example that recently Letseng discovered a 160 carat diamond that sold for $68,000 a carat. Uh, it's open pit, so it's low operating costs. We have a low strip ratio. We're fortunate. Uh, you can see this is our camp. Can we focus this a little bit? Don't know if you can see that. No? OK. I'll carry on. Uh, we have been awarded the mining lease. So that basically means that all the environmental and legislative hurdles to actually go into production have been crossed. So it's just a case of now expanding the current site for first stage production. And this is basically what it looks like. You've got, and you'll see this in the handout if you want to take a copy away with you. It's a bowl on the side of the mountain. It's about 300 meters by about 250 meters in size. It will be a pit taking out about uh, 1.3 tons of waste for every ton of kimberlite. So there's about 50 million tons, 48 million tons of kimberlite to come out and just over the same amount in waste rock. 
Uh, the first stage is going to take development capital of about seven and a half to ten million dollars. Uh, and that will produce, that will give us a mine with a capacity of about half a million ton a year. So what we intend doing is running that for two years. That'll generate about 20,000 carats, which on current projections should be a more or less break-even situation. We look to be making at about $15 million, i.e. covering the cost of that investment. But the real advantage that will give us is it will give us a very, very uh, good handle and information for a definitive feasibility study which, with which to justify the main investment, which two, two and a half years down the line would be for a sort of a world-class mine on the scale of what Firestone are doing at Likabong, what uh, Gem already have at uh, Letseng, which is going to be a three plus million ton a year mine, which is going to have a life on 48 million tons of 12, 15 years. Uh, and again, there's underground potential, there's subsequent potential beyond that, but let's look just at the open pit stage. So, again, to summarize, we were in, we've just completed the pre-production stage. We've determined the size of the kimberlite, both on surface and in depth. We've got a tonnage estimate. We have recovered carrots. We've got some value indications and grade indications. Part of the problem of these Lesotho kimberlites is they have few, very large, very valuable stones. So they're not as easy to evaluate as a sort of a, a typical world standard kimberlite, which has got lots of small diamonds. So we will move into stage one production, which is half a million ton a year for two years, and that will give us the information we need to justify the investment and to raise the investment for the subsequent stage two. And as I said, stage two is the proper full-scale mine. So the development, this is what we've done so far. As a, you know, again, there's an element of repetition here, but we've completed a scoping study. The scoping study is important because it allows us to compare what it's going to cost to develop this. So, as I said, there's four other mines in the country. The cost of putting them into production is well known. The cost of capital and the cost of operating can, can be well defined. We've shown from 300 carats recovered that the grade is over 2 carat 100 ton. That's comparable to other kimberlites in Lesotho. And we've shown that we're achieving values. We're, we're getting large stones. The largest stone out of that 300 carats was nearly 9 carats. Uh, so that's about 10% of the total production is likely to be in the order of 10 carats or above. We've got infrastructure on the ground. We've got power generation for stage one mining is already in place. The generators are there. We've got the water supply, which is always an issue in Lesotho, but we've got water pipelines in and we can go into production. We've got the 10 year mining license. Uh, and we've also done a deal to acquire a process plant. So the idea is over the coming months we'll conclude that deal and move the process plant and basically be in stage one production on the basis of half a million ton a year by the end of this year. And again, just to come through and, and, and summarize, but uh, the, the ultimate stage two goal then is after that two year period is over, is to put it into production on the basis of three million ton a year, which should give us 65,000 carats at least 10 year life and there's further potential for underground mining as well. And again, just to give you the idea of the sampling, the first box, that's where we are now. We've taken 15,000 tons and we've got 300 carats. But as you go up in scale, you start to get the large diamonds which are rarer. So the next stage, the middle box, that's stage one mining. That's going to be a million tons. And on that basis, we expect about 10% of our carats or 2,000 carats in total to be special stones. Those are stones of 10 carats or above. And we also expect that to include maybe one, possibly more, 100 carat stones. And by the time you get into the final production where you're doing several million tons a year, then you're starting to get these stones with regular occurrence. It's a sampling frequency artifact. So a few, a few views of the background mining. Uh, it's, it's a large project, we've got uh, various support, we've got good consultants, good lab facilities, you're basically drawing on all the mining infrastructure in Johannesburg in terms of suppliers, equipment, uh, you're only about uh, four hours away from DHL deliveries of spare parts, etc. It's not like being in a remote location in Central Africa or West Africa or even in the Arctic tundra. We've also got a few other projects. We've got a kimberlite fissure system, a dike. Uh, these would be more like the sign of 
operations you have in West Africa where we've done some work. We're looking at developing that with local partnership because it is a small project compared to what we're doing at Lempani. But we've already got a resource of a million carats in the ground there that has been drilled and is ready to go. And we're at an advanced level on the scoping study and we'll be applying for a mining lease for that as well. But that's going to be a sort of a peripheral satellite operation which we want to do with a local partner. Uh, as I said as well, we've got the project in Zambia. We hope to be doing some work come the dry season there, which starts in May, but we've got 14 targets there. Some of them are very big, uh, lamproites up to 45 hectares in size. And again, we've got uh, some ground in, Zambia, in Botswana where we want to do some exploration later in this year as well, including in the Sabong field where other companies suddenly found, certainly found some very large kimberlites recently. So the investment case, this is a, these are actual photos of Lempani diamonds recovered in the last year. Put the process plant into position, continue with the geological work and refine it. This is all work that's going to contribute towards the feasibility study. Within uh, the first quarter of 2014, uh, sorry, 2015, we'll have production coming in, so we'll start to get the results very early on. Uh, and we'll start to build towards a feasibility study. Uh, by the end of stage one, we hope to have an indicated and inferred resource over the entire Kimberlite. We hope to be basically where Firestone are at this moment in time in Motai with a decision to build a full-scale mine. So, I'll, I'll just skip through this. This is really just a repetition of what I was saying earlier. And again, that. The important thing. This is what Lesotho can actually produce. That's a photo of the Lesotho, uh, prom Lesotho promise, 600 carat stone uh, that was produced by the Letseng mine, one of the largest diamonds in the world. Letseng is one of the few places that produces these large diamonds and the other Kimberlites in Lesotho are not far behind. So you're looking at a very select niche market here. This is the, the creme de la creme. The Lesotho mines are the Bugattis compared to Botswana's Volkswagens. They really are exceptional. This is the Lesotho Promise. It was cut into 23 stones. It was sold at the time, I believe, for about 26 million. I believe that the final production was worth something in the order of 100 million, which shows the upside that can be gained. More recently, another mine on our doorstep has found a 30 carat pink diamond which I am anecdotally informed is likely to tender for about half a million dollars a carat. So that one stone can produce $15 million of revenue. So you have to look at that in the context of what we're doing even in stage one. Yes, you make the bread and butter and you cover the recovery of operating costs and investment on the run of mine production. But there's a potential at all these stages to produce one of these large stones which literally can double the revenue on the mine. And Lesotho is famous for this. So this is what really is the, is the project maker to have something like this come out. And it happens in Lesotho. Again, at Letseng, in this bottom one, Letseng recovered two stones of 160 carats in the last couple of months. The larger of the, uh, the, the more valuable of those stones, I think sold for $68,000 a carat. And then finally, seeing as, uh, you know, it's very hard for people to visualize, the last slide I'd like to show you. That's the Lempani Kimberlite, and we're sitting in that building just to the right of it there. It shows you just how big these things are. The Lempani Kimberlite is 350 meters by 250 meters. You can fit Westminster Cathedral into it a dozen times over. And we know that it goes down at least 350 meters without getting substantially smaller. So there is a vast volume of kimberlite there, which we've shown to be diamondiferous. What we need to do now over the next two years is demonstrate the value throughout that kimberlite and demonstrate that it is warrants the, product, the investment for a large-scale mine. But like I said, every other kimberlite pipe in, in Lesotho has been successful on that basis. Letseng is uh, producing about 6 million tons a year. Cow is producing about 3 million tons a year. Uh, there is development work underway at Likabong and at Motai. And what we hope to do is be the fifth and final large diamond mine in Lesotho. Uh, we're already on the way. We've got the mining license. 
we've got the arrangement for the plant, we've got the infrastructure in place, and what we want to do is we want to have our first stage of production in place by the end of this year. Thanks. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If you could hear me at the back, that is. No, I mean, Petra is, is, is a major first-tier producer. Petra is almost just below Al Rosa and, uh, and De Beers at this stage. Uh, we hope to be, in the next two to three years, we hope to be sort of with Kuroi, uh gem diamonds, maybe of that, of that order of magnitude, mid-tier companies, but with a very niche select production, like, like they are indeed. It's ongoing, we're having discussions with several major partners on this, but it's not an onerous burden on funding. We, we're looking at about $5 million capital. We're, we're trying to be smart and learn from uh, the lessons of others. Uh, the plant that we're looking at that we've already got a deal in principle with is the plant that Lucara used to process 700,000 tons. We want to produce uh, a million tons through it, so it's, it's, it's a perfectly suitable plant. It'll require some upgrades, but you know, again, the deal we did with Lucara was very favorable. They want to get rid of it, we want it. It's in the country, there's no import duties. It's a case of taking it down at one location, moving it 20 miles and putting it up at another location. And that's, that's the principal cost, by the way. The mining, everything else can be done in Lesotho by contract. So you don't need to own yellow equipment. You don't need to invest in, in a major infrastructure. You can rent the accommodation. You get a company, pick up the phone, they come and put porter cabins up for you. You want earth moved, you want a million tons moved, you call a contractor, they come in and move it for you and take their machines away. So there's very little that you have to do apart from put in the plant. Well, I mean, there's always gossip in the industry. Uh, I think there is, just generally in the sector, there is a, a likelihood that a readjustment's going to have to take place. Uh, I'm not saying uh, that it's not on or off the cards. I'm saying that I believe that if the company was made a reasonable offer by a reputable company and it was in the interest of the shareholders, we wouldn't be averse to it. But we, we would consider anything like that on its merits. I did it on time. Yeah. So what can we expect the, the news from this uh, from the funding? I'm sorry. What can we expect the news from? I think, I think we should have something, it's always hard to put a time frame on these things because there's regulatory issues, but I certainly think our, our plan is to have it in production by the final quarter of this year and obviously we would have to have the funding in place to do that. So by hook or by crook we want to get this into production before the end of the year. Uh, we've got some hard copies at our stall if you'd like to take a copy with. I don't know if we could put it on the website, but it's probably easier because, you know, versions change. It's easier to take away a hard copy. In fact, I've got one, I've got one hard copy here to save you the, the trip back to the booth. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.